Welcome into today's edition of Just a Truth. Glad to have you join me in the PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio. To lose weight for the last time, visit myphdweightloss.com. The prosecution rested its case yesterday afternoon in the Trump New York City trial, and what a day it was. You know, we've all known that the New York trial of Donald Trump is a sham, but Michael Cohen's testimony really brought that home yesterday. And some legal experts say Cohen's admission in court that he stole from the Trump organization further damaged the disbarred attorney's credibility and could lead, at the very least, to a deadlock jury that cannot reach a verdict. We have all the details and the update on that. Have you tried to get an appointment with your doctor only to have to wait weeks, sometimes months? Problems securing appointments to see doctors in the U.S. are exasperated by soaring health care demand and fewer doctors with primary care and emergency medicine among the hardest hit according to an article published in the Epic Times. Also, the South Carolina Freedom Caucus issued a policy memo on the so-called health czar yesterday, expressing their concern about an effort that's underway to have the legislature back in Columbia to take action on the bill this year. Over the past few weeks, we've seen a number of elected GOP leaders attend the New York trial of President Trump. The latest, South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson attended yesterday's Manhattan trial, where Trump is being criminally prosecuted for falsifying business records to cover up an alleged sex scandal. I told you we'd be back. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's Joey Hudson. I wanted to name it the Joey Hudson Bill, but, you know, they don't allow you to name put names on bills, (laughs) but I wanted to call it the Joey Hudson Bill because I I know that one's been near and dear to you for a number of years. That's how it's done. Let your voice be heard. And the truth! shall set you free here's joey hudson what a day in the manhattan court yesterday where president trump is being tried in a clear political persecution case just when you think things can't get more more bizarre (laughs) they actually do trump spoke to reporters as he was entering the court to start another week of testimony yesterday all of the things you see that you saw over the last four weeks most of it should have never even been brought up And then on top of that, there's no crime. And we go on day after day, and I can tell Iowa, I'm sorry, I won't be able to make it. I tell New Hampshire, sorry, I won't be able to make it. I'm sitting in an icebox all day. This case should be dismissed. It should have never been brought. And the judge is highly conflicted. He's a corrupt judge. He's highly conflicted. He's totally corrupt. And he's interfering with an election. The big question raised yesterday, could Michael Cohen's admission in court that he actually stole from the Trump organization further damage this disbarred attorney's credibility? And more importantly, could it potentially lead to a jury who cannot reach a verdict? That's the question the legal community was left with yesterday after these bombshell admissions. Heritage Foundation's single, uh, senior legal fellow, Zach Smith, in, a, uh, in an interview on Fox News said, I think after last week's cross-examination, Michael Cohen's credibility as a witness had already pretty much been eviscerated. If there were any lingering doubts in the minds of any jurors, I suspect today's testimony was even more damaging. I mean, think about this. Put yourself in one of the chairs of the jurors. And you have the prosecution trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a former president of the United States had known about some of the shady dealings of this attorney, of an attorney who is now disbarred, and then admits that he stole from his client. And that's what happened yesterday. Michael Cohen admitted in testimony that he stole $30,000 from the Trump organization by overstating how much he paid a tech company that provided services for the Trump organization. Cohen said he told the former Trump organization CFO, Alan Weisselberg, uh, this was in 2017, that he had paid this tech firm, identified as Red Finch, $50,000 out of his own pocket and that he still needed to be reimbursed for the payment. Weisselberg and Cohen in 2017 calculated a 420000 repayment to Cohen for his 130000 payment, uh, supposedly to uh, porn star Stormy Daniels, as well as the alleged 50000 payment to Red Finch. Cohen's payment to Daniels came ahead of the 2016 election, of course, to supposedly quiet her claims of an alleged affair with Trump. 
Cohen said Monday, as he was testifying in the court, however, that of the $50,000 that he was given to pay Red Finch, he only gave him 20000 of it, meaning that he had pocketed 30000 when he was reimbursed. Trump attorney Todd Blanche asked Cohen, you stole from the Trump org, right? Cohen responded, yes, sir. George Washington University law professor and Fox News contributor Jonathan Turley responded to these new revelations from Cohen. Well, this has been rather otherworldly uh, to sit and watch this. It's like you've entered a parallel universe. I mean, the how this case is going forward, I just cannot explain. You had a, a disbarred, convicted serial perjurer on the stand, matter-of-factly detailing how he stole tens of thousands of dollars from his client. And what is really funny is then the prosecutor gets up and says, I just want you to tell the jury, once again, you're not charged with anything, right? And I wanted to stand up and say, yeah, but you should have. He just admitted that he committed grand larceny. He told you that, and you instead decided he was more valuable to pursue a dead misdemeanor on a bookkeeping violation. Turley's right, isn't he? I mean, the prosecutor gets back up to cross-examine to to try to clear this whole thing up. You know, I don't know if the prosecutor knew going into this that Michael Cohen was going to admit to stealing money from his client. If he did, shame on him for, for even having Cohen in the courtroom, right? Heritage legal fellow Zach Smith added, It does make you wonder two things. One, did the prosecution not know about this before they put Michael Cohen on the stand? I find that doubtful, he said. But if they didn't, that it's its own issue. If they knew about this and chose to put Michael Cohen on the stand regardless, that in some ways is even more shocking because it really begs the question of what kind of credibility can Michael Cohen be expected to have given that even he admitted to stealing from the truck Trump organization for his own benefit. Cohen testified that the Trump organization thought he paid the full amount for which he was still reimbursed despite not having actually paid it. Blanche asked Cohen, you lied to Weiselberg about how much you needed for Redfinch. Cohen confirmed that yes, he had. Blanche then asked, have you paid the Trump organization for the money you stole from them? No, sir. Cohen responded. Later in the testimony, Mr. Cohen said that taking the 30000 was, quote, almost like self-help, claiming he took the funds because he was angry about his bonus getting slashed. Cohen said, I was angry because of the reduction in the bonus, and I just felt like it was almost like self-help. So basically, he's justifying this stealing to himself. He said, to have my bonus cut by two-thirds was very upsetting, to say the least. So he just decided, I'll take it in, in another way. Jonathan Turley pointed out how absurd this type of testimony is and how the prosecutors didn't seem to mind that their star witness is a thief. Well, that's the question. Is He's been under investigation for many, many years, so when he admitted to it doesn't really mean the fact that they couldn't have determined this. But the interesting thing about uh, Cohen is how really blasé this all is. Yeah, I, I stole money from my client. I lied <laughs> repeatedly. I violated all of these oaths. And, and people are just sort of nodding, and you feel like you're the only one in the room saying, this is not normal, okay? This is, <laughs> this is not how trials are supposed to go. Uh, but the prosecutor then got up to try to resuscitate him and pound on his chest and, you know, get his heart going again. And it, it made it even worse, you know, because much of what the prosecutor talked about really didn't change the thrust of, of his arguments. So at the end of the day, this is a shiny object that is being used to distract the jury from the fact that they have glaring problems. You know, they had witnesses that said, look, we listed this as a legal expense because we paid it to a lawyer. You have the key role of Weiselberg, who's sitting 15 minutes from here, who was the one who said, yeah, why don't we treat this as a retainer, which probably made sense to him because Cohen should have had a retainer, but he was a really bad lawyer. And so, like many things, he didn't do that. But now the prosecutors are using his failure as a basis to convict his client. And then he's adding to that and saying, I think you should send my client to jail for following my legal advice. If this weren't so serious, that would actually be funny. That Cohen thinks Trump should go to jail because he listened to a kook like himself 
uh, and took his legal advice. Wow. Who should go to jail here? Michael Cohen? Should, should Michael Cohen be charged now? Now, I understand there's a whole statute of limitation question uh, here. I, I don't know that he actually can be. But let's assume for a moment that the statute of limitations would allow him to be prosecuted. Does the prosecutor have a duty to now come back and charge Michael Cohen? Love to get your comments. You can send me a quick text message. Email me, joey at joeyhudson.com. Shouldn't someone step up here and call Alvin Bragg out for having his star witness being a thief? You tell me, joey at joeyhudson.com. Hope you'll join the conversation today. 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Send your comments to the Furman Ford text line. You can leave a quick voice message and your emails are always welcome. Joey at joeyhudson.com. Joey Hudson here. I was talking to a good friend the other day and he mentioned that he has started taking the weight loss injection drug that was initially made to treat type 2 diabetes. He said he's losing weight, but the day after he takes the injection, he is so sick he can't leave the house. That got me thinking. Most of us go on a weight loss journey so that we can feel better and get healthy. Folks, losing weight should not make you sick. I can tell you firsthand, four years ago when I started PhD weight loss and nutrition, I was never hungry or agitated. I never felt sick. In fact, I felt great the very first First week. The PhD side effects are better sleep, more energy, smaller clothes, and a general sense of well being. Getting healthy should not make you sick, and it shouldn't make you dependent on a drug either. Simply put, PhD is freedom. You will not be dependent on a drug because there are no drugs. You'll learn to eat for your body and you won't gain the weight back. They have a lifetime maintenance program and PhD teaches you to trust yourself and your knowledge. Call them today, 864-252-4925. Find them online at myphdweightloss.com. That's 864-252-4925. The South Carolina Freedom Caucus issued a policy memo on the so-called health czar yesterday expressing their continued concern about an effort underway to have the legislature back in Columbia to take action on the bill. In an open letter yesterday, the Freedom Caucus wrote, At the end of the legislative session, Representative Josiah Magnuson of Spartanburg used a procedural motion to kill S-915 or the health czar bill. Since then, the governor and several members of the leadership have expressed interest in resurrecting the bill despite overwhelming grassroots opposition and clear concerns expressed by conservatives. They write, we felt it was important to communicate once again what our objections are to the bill and what are some potential solutions that could make the bill better. So here's what's happening. Last week, Governor Henry McMaster called on lawmakers to take up a health care agency reorganization plan when they return next month, even though this specific topic is not part of an agreement on what the General Assembly can work on when they return. Speaking to reporters to discuss the end of the legislative session, Governor McMaster said that the merging of six health agencies and the creation of the Executive Office of Health and Policy Needs sh should be done this year. The governor said the state's health care system has been characterized as one of the most fractured in the country. He quoted, hopefully we'll find a way to get that bill into the conference and solve this problem. We can't wait another day. There was a sense of urgency there from the governor's office. McMaster would not put blame on any particular lawmaker group, according to the state newspaper, uh, despite the House Freedom Caucus taking credit for killing the bill for the year after they characterized it as creating a health czar. There's been a lot of discussion on this bill on both sides. And the, the mere mention of the idea of South Carolina having a health czar just really sends chills down most people's spines. But on the flip side of this, you have Governor McMaster and others. I've had uh, Senator Josh Kimbrell from Spartanburg, a, a guy that I admire greatly on the show, who explained, and, and, and in fact, on the last day of the session, I happened to be moderating an event in Spartanburg of all the candidates in Spartanburg County, both uh, county council, legislative, uh, house seats, senate seats. So some of the legislators literally uh, adjourned in Columbia and drove straight to Spartanburg to our event. Josiah Magnuson was one of those, and he had an opportunity to speak, and he told us how he was successful in getting uh, get, getting the bill killed by not uh, by not allowing a vote on it. Senator Kimbrell followed him and explained in, in, in his terms, and has since been on this radio show, that we essentially have a health czar now with, with a unruly DHEC 
who answers to no one. And his argument is, and as is Governor McMaster and, and other GOP leaders, that in, or, in order to get control of DHEC, we need to create and divide uh, DHEC as, it, as it's known now and create this new agency so that they would be accountable to someone. That's the argument for this. So here's what happened in those final hours of the session and why there seems to be a sense of urgency to get this back in front of legislators for another vote. On July the 1st of this year, coming up, the Department of Health and Environmental Control will split into the Department of Public Health and the Department of Environmental Services in hopes of improving communication, coordination between health agencies, improving services. Lawmakers wanted to merge the new Department of Public Health with the Departments of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, Disabilities and Special Needs, Health and Human Services, Mental Health, and Aging to create the Executive Office of Health and Policy. Several of those agencies are already slated to move uh, to a new health campus in Casey, just outside of Columbia, in July. So on the last days of the session, the House passed a health care agency restructuring bill getting past procedu- uh, procedural moves, including asking for the clerk to read the entire bill aloud to delay its passage. Eventually, that request was rescinded, and the House passed the bill, sending it back to the, to the Senate with some changes. Senators then amended the legislation on their final day of the session with less than an hour before adjournment to include medical freedom provisions that could have addressed concerns made by the Freedom Caucus, they say. When it came back to the House and members tried to bring it up for immediate consideration, that's when State Representative Josiah Magnuson of Spartanburg, a member of the House Freedom Caucus, objected and stalled the bill and kept it from coming to a vote and prevented a conference committee from being in, uh, being formed. The state newspaper reports lawmakers have may have options to bring the health agency's restructuring back up sooner rather than next year because that's been part of the argument as well. It can come back next year. You can start all over again in a new legislative session. But here's the catch to that, and here's what Governor McMaster is wanting to happen. The General Assembly is scheduled to be back on June the 5th to hold a state Supreme Court justice election and is expected to be back at least two more times later in June to complete work on the state budget. All legislation that didn't get passed in both chambers by 5 p.m. on Thursday, May the 9th, died. However, if they're back in session, uh, and, and as it stands right now, only the judicial election and bills deal, dealing with the annual budget or are in conference committee, can now be brought up under the sine die agreement. In other words, as they were adjourning, they agreed, okay, we will take these up when we come back in June. However, and there's always a catch when you're dealing with the legislature, that agreement can be changed if there is a two-thirds vote in both chambers and could potentially allow for debate on the health agency restructuring. And that's what has a lot of people concerned now. Also, lawmakers could potentially attach a proviso to the budget if those finalizing the spending plan receive free conference powers, a move that could uh, could also be done, again, with a two-thirds vote of both chambers. Uh, the, the legislators who are in favor of this point out that it passed the House in, with a 98-15 to 15 vote, and it passed the Senate with a 44-1 to 1 vote. So there appears to be a lot of support for it, But there's a lot of people in the grassroots uh, who are concerned about it. I received a number of text messages yesterday and emails over the past few days once Governor McMaster started talking about potentially raising this issue again when when the legislature is back in Columbia in June a couple of times, maybe even three times, dealing with the budget. And that's what has some people who were opposed to this bill because, again, they called it the health care czar. Uh, there was a there was an image painted that we were going to have an Anthony Fauci at the state level, and that's what scares everybody. People do not want a health care czar in South Carolina. So call your state rep, call your state senator, call the governor's office, let your voice be heard, let them know how you feel about this. Hope you'll join the conversation today, 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Send your comments to the Furman Ford text line. You can leave a quick voice message. And your emails are always welcome, Joey, at joeyhudson.com.
whether you're replacing a broken appliance or maybe you're just upgrading, you're totally remodeling the kitchen. When it's time to get those new appliances, when you're ready for them, you don't want to have to wait weeks or even months to get started using them, right? Well, that's not the case when you shop with my friends at Discounted Appliance Warehouse. With over 11,000 square feet and 1,500 appliances at any, any given time, you can buy today and use today quite often. I'm talking about shopping with my friends at Discounted Appliance Warehouse in Pickens. It's worth the short drive over to Pickens. Jeff, Johnny, Kyle, the whole team over there, they'll take good care of you. They have an award-winning service department, expert installation, extended warranties, and at Discounted Appliance Warehouse, they treat you like family. You're more than just a credit card swipe to all the team over there. Discounted Appliance Warehouse, they're proud to offer Speed Queen, the only washer and dryers with manufacturer's warranties that cover parts and labor. You owe it to yourself if you're looking for a new appliance to head over to Pickens to Discounted Appliance Warehouse online at dawpickens.com, dawpickens.com. Have you had a problem recently? Maybe you need some medical attention. You just weren't, weren't feeling well and you had an issue getting an appointment to see a doctor. This seems to be a problem, not just in our area, even though healthcare seems to be bigger than ever, but this is a problem that we're seeing across the country and it's exasperated by soaring healthcare demand and fewer doctors were told this, according to an article in the Epic times, many specializations are cre- increasingly affected by this trend. But the ones that are primarily affected and the ones that we're really seeing the pain in is primary care and emergency medicine. They're hit the hardest, according to this article. The average wait time to see a doctor has increased since 2017 and has continued to rise after the demand spike that was brought on during the COVID-19 pandemic. A survey conducted by AMN Healthcare in 2022 of the 15 large metro markets revealed that the average time to see a physician was 26 days, an 8% increase from 2017 and prior to the uh, to the pandemic, and a 24% spike since 2004 when they first started doing the survey. Staff constraints are also felt in hospital emergency department. Nearly 140 million Americans visited a hospital emergency department in 2021, the last numbers available based on data from the Centers for Disease Control. Of those, about 13% resulted in hospital admission, and thousands waited hours to see health care providers. If you've ever been to an emergency room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you can go and you can end up waiting literally hours. Uh, those of you who've been listening to me for some time now may recall that in 2021, I had a health issue, and I saw that firsthand. Over a period of several months, I ended up in the emergency room four different times, and it is excruciating. It's bad enough to be in pain. It's bad enough to be sick, sick enough that you just make that decision. And believe me, every time I went, it was, it was, I I waited to the very end till I couldn't stand it any longer. And my doctor said, go to the emergency room because it is a beating. You're there all night long. And keep in mind, when I was going through this, my sweet wife, Peg, this was, this was when they were still not allowing family members to come into the hospital. And she'd have to sit in, in the car in, in the dark because this always happens in the middle of the night, as you know. And she's sitting alone in the car in a dark parking area. One study analyzed more than 1,000 hospitals between 2007 and the end of 2021 and found that those with the worst performance had 4.4% of emergency room patients actually leave before they got medical attention. They just couldn't, they couldn't wait any longer. So they left at the end of 2021, that number had risen to almost 10%. So think about that. You go to the hospital because you need help. You wait in the emergency room and the wait becomes so long that you just decide to leave. Now, I don't know if they, if they are leaving and going to another emergency room, going to another healthcare provider or what. But believe me, in, in those instances where I had waited for literally hours, I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> I would have stayed there to the bitter end to try to get some help. According to the Epic Times, compounding the issue is that nearly half of the doctor population is reaching retirement age within the next 10 years 
uh, or some are actually leaving the profession because of burnout. Almost 50% of doctors report that they feel burned out according to a 2024 Medscape report. They just don't want to do it anymore. It's not, it's not what they signed up for. It's not why they spent years and years of in school going to med school and, and all the sacrifices that they, that they had to make to go to med school to try to help people, to try to treat people, and then they get into it, and it's not what they signed up for. They're not able to help people the way they want to help people. And these are the key factors that seems to be driving the U.S.'s growing scarcity of doctors. Physician Thrive's 2023 study stated that the United States may have a shortage of 124,000 doctors by 2034. And within that shortfall, up to 48,000 will likely be lost from primary care while the industry is projected to lose another 58,000 specialists like surgeons and nurse practitioners. Emergency physician Dr. Jared Ross told the Epic Times, this is definitely coming down to the pipeline. It's been coming for a long time, and we're seeing this all across healthcare." he said. Dr. Ross is also president of Missouri-based Emergency Medical Services Education and Consulting. He's watched the U.S.'s health care worker crisis unfold on the front lines and says that the shortage of physicians is an old problem that is now reaching a tipping point. He said, we've talked about this for years. It's nothing new. There's been a number of attempted stopgap measures that haven't been all that successful. These provisional solutions, he says, include uh, bringing in more practitioners from foreign countries, introducing medical school loan forgiveness programs, expanding telehealth services, and increasing the number of resident physician training uh, supported by Medicare. Dr. Rawls said he's seen doctor shortages affect emergency medicine, but noted that primary care has really struggled to retain physicians. And, and we're seeing that around here. Have you tried to find a new primary care doctor recently? It, it can be tough. You, you have to ask friends. You have to ask church friends. You know, who do you see? Who's your doctor? Will you, uh, will you put in a good word for me? Of course, there, of course on the uh, flip side of that, you've got all of these, uh, these 24-hour uh, emergency medical centers popping up everywhere. But who wants to go to, a, to one of these centers, acute care centers or whatever you call them, and see somebody different every time. I, I want to have a relationship with my doctor. I want to know. I want to know this doctor, who who he is or who she is, and and for them to know my history. That's important to me. Is it? Isn't it to you? And Dr. Ross points out that the primary care shortage is critical for two reasons. One is that healthcare demands in the U.S. are rising. Uh, my, my generation, the baby boomers, we're getting older and we're needing more help. The average number of times Americans visit a doctor per year is four times for adults, nine for infants, and two for children between the ages of five and 15, according to Vanguard Medical Group. The other reason is what Dr. Ross called the corporization of medicine. He said the problem is we have an insurance system that is a massive bureaucracy, bingo. That, and that's, that's it. That's the elephant in the room. We have an insurance system that is a massive bureaucracy. And every doctor that I've talked to, and I've talked to a lot of them, uh, over the last few years when I was involved with repealing certificate of need, uh, an issue that I became very uh, passionate about. And, and that, that is going to help increase more competition in health care in, in, in South Carolina. But we still have some challenges. But, but the thing that doctors told me most, and quite often, you know, one of the uh, trends that we've seen in our area have, have been that independent doctors have been selling their practices to some of the big boys on the street, like, like Prisma. Prisma has become huge. Just about every private practice is owned by Prisma now. And they do that because they want to get out of the bureaucratic side of it. They want to get out of the collections. They want to get out of arguing back and forth with insurance companies about what they can charge for a certain procedure or for a office visit. 
Uh, Dr. Ross said that at a recent conference with other medical leaders, it was discussed that the United States has really pushed away from the model of traditional health care. He said there was a general consensus within the group that insurance companies have become too powerful in medicine. I won't argue with that, will you? I think that is the real problem. Insurance companies are driving what you and I can do. Dr. William Schaffner, he's an infectious disease specialist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, told the Epic Times the administrative, administrative burden or hassle, as many doctors describe it, is very disheartening. Having worked in medicine for over 40 years, Dr. Schaffner has witnessed it evolve into something aggressively more complicated, he said, as insurance companies expand power over doctors. He said this trend became more noticeable in the 1990s. Doctors didn't go to medical school in, in anticipation of arguing with insurance companies. It's depressing and discouraging, he said. In 2020, for the first time, less than 50% of U.S. physicians worked in private practice, according to the American Medical Association. Must have cho- most of them have chosen to become employees of large medical groups, which has drastically changed the paradigm of healthcare. Just what I was talking about a minute ago. So many of them have sold their practices to a larger healthcare group in order to get out of the bureaucracy. They, don't, they, they feel like they're having to battle the insurance companies constantly. An AMA survey of physicians showed that 88% felt that the burden associated with prior authorization protocols with insurance was high or extremely high, and they spent an average of 14 hours a week doing just that, trying to convince the insurance company that a particular procedure was warranted. Doctors shouldn't have to be doing that. Doctors shouldn't have have to be running, getting permission from an insurance company to do what he or she thinks is best for their patient. You agree? comments are welcome you can send me a quick text message email me as well joey at joeyhudson.com it's bad isn't it it's bad that doctors have to feel this way and it's even worse for us the patient hope you'll join the conversation today 864-477-JOEY 864-477-5639 send your comments to the firm and forward text line you can leave a quick voice message and your emails are always welcome joey at joeyhudson.com. Speaking of the Furman Ford text line, you know, it's never been more important to support locally run businesses owned by people who actually live here in the upstate. Let me take a minute to talk with you about our friends at Furman Ford. If you're looking for a new vehicle, maybe a great pre-owned vehicle, one you can, you could trust, or maybe you're looking to order that special vehicle. Uh, either way, if you want a new one, a brand new one, or a pre-owned that you can trust, the, the folks at Furman Ford, they're there to help you. Their name is on the sign because their name is on the line because every single tra- transaction is important to them. Jim Furman, Matthew Furman, they do business the right way. When you uh, stop by, when you give them a call, or maybe when you just uh, send them a quick email, you're always going to have access to a member of the Furman Ford family. And by the way, they also offer great service, and you're not going to have to wait weeks and weeks to get it done and you do not have had to purchase your vehicle at firm and ford doesn't even have to be a ford they they service all makes and models visit my friends at firm and ford online at firm and firmandford.com on the text line texter says good morning joey i so hate the sound of biden's voice that i sang sweetly sings the donkey until you stopped him love the podcast thank you for all you do and for sunrise carolina thank you appreciate that uh yeah he's referencing uh, I, I played some uh, some of Joe Biden yesterday, and um, I got a lot of you saying, hey, please don't make me listen to him. Uh, of course, we were talking about his remarks at the commencement at Morehouse College over the weekend and some of the idiotic things that the president of the United States had to say. He, he went there to deliver a commencement speech, which should have been encouraging these young black men on the opportunities that this great country of ours, yes, it has its warts, and, and boy, are we are we divided like never before, but it's still the best country to live in in the world. And Joe Biden, our president, the, the, the man who promised that he was going to bring us back together, you remember all the talk back in 2020 of how he was going to be the great uniter? And he goes to Morehouse College, and he tells these young men, that that they're being cheated, that black Americans uh, aren't getting their fair shake. 
I mean, did you listen to, to his speech? It was horrible. It was horrible and exaggerated. Don't get me started on that. I did that yesterday. Ray writes on the text line, quick and easy, Joey. The Pope is criticizing Texas over them wanting to shut down a Catholic NGO that traffics illegal aliens into the USA. Send them to the Vatican. Lots of room there. Fill that up and see how much love the Pope has for them. Bottom line, the old communist needs to take care of his church and stay out of how we run our country. Other than that, all is well. Thank you, Ray. Uh, He's referencing, of course, the Pope chiming in about our border issues. Look, I've been to the Vatican. It's a beautiful place. But you know what? Uh, what is uh, the first thing you see when you go to the Vatican? The walls. The Vatican is completely enclosed with walls. They have a big gate that they can close if they don't want you to come in. So what hypocrisy. And, and look, I, I, I hesitate to be critical of the Pope because he is a, a godly man, but he does. He needs to stay out of our issues. He, he needs to, he, he should not have an opinion on what we do at our southern border, a man who lives behind a wall. Texter says, I'm starting to cut ties with friends and family that support Democrats. I can't associate with folks that vote for the destruction of the country. I've tried to educate them, but they, like all lives, believe that they are the smartest creatures in the forest. Still no hummingbird show. Uh, (laughs) All right, I'll I'll stop there on that one. A texter says the word is one officer told him to go around and the second officer tried to stop him. This, of course, on the Scotty Scheffler, which, by the way, his his arraignment was supposed to have been today. It has been delayed until uh, early June because of a conflict in his attorney's schedule. There are rumors that the, that the charges will probably be completely dropped before it ever gets to that point. Texter, PGA officials' vehicles don't have the same leeway that fire trucks, ambulances, and police cars using lights and sirens have. And, well, you know, the, the thing that I think Scotty Scheffler, in his defense, and he seems to be a fine, young Christian man, by the way, but these guys are used to having an entrance for the players where they don't have to wait in line, where they don't have to uh, sit in traffic for, for fans to walk by and, and, and stare at. And I really think, based on what I've heard him say and what others have said, was that Scotty Scheffler felt like that he was just going to pull around the traffic and go into the player's entrance. Uh, and, and look, I, I'm a defender of the police I support the police, but there's also reports that this, this police officer, by the way, there's no webcam footage because he didn't turn his webcam, uh, his uh, body cam on, but there are reports, you know, a lot of other police officers have said, look, all he had to do, he was right there at the parking, at the player's parking area, rather than grabbing hold of the car and holding on to it, just follow, follow the car in. Texture says, don't get mixed up, Joey, just because Biden is losing black support doesn't mean they're going to vote for Trump. Well, they may not vote at all. You're right. However, polls show that Donald Trump is getting a larger percentage of the black vote than any Republican in history. And and he actually did in 2020, right? Texter says, Brandon could fix the problem on his own by reversing what he did on day one, reinstate, stay in Mexico, and deport all illegals. Speaking of deporting all illegals, you know, we, we talk often about the southern border and how to fix it. Some have said, well, what are we going to do with all those who are already here? Well, it appears that most Americans agree and are are in agreement that they should be sent back. They should be deported. Illegal immigration is one of the top issues on the minds of American voters heading into the primaries coming up this summer. Ours is on June the 11th. Early voting starts May 28th in South Carolina. Across the nation is a hotly contested uh, issue that congressional race candidates are having to, to address. They're being asked what, are, what their views are on, on illegals invading the country, and the big question is what to do with the ones who are already here. A new poll seems to answer that question. An Ipsos poll said 56% of voters support deporting illegals, send them back to their home country. 
More than half of U.S. voters, according to this poll, support deporting all illegal immigrants in the country and believe that that is the solution to those who are already in our country. The survey found a little over one in three voters said they support establishing detention camps for illegal immigrants awaiting deportation. Among the breakdown of voters, 56% support deporting all illegal immigrants. 36% support detention camps for the illegals until they're deported. 54% oppose detention camps for illegal immigrants. So I guess there's a debate on how we do it, but most people believe that they should be deported. Republicans were far more likely to support deporting all or most illegal immigrants than Democrats or independent voters. 85% of Republicans, 85% of people who identified as Republicans who said they'd be voting in a Republican primary support deporting all or most illegal immigrants. 61% of Democrats support deporting all or most illegals. 35% of independents, which is surprising to me. I would have thought that, that there'd be more independents who would support it than Democrats. But that tells you where we are with this issue, doesn't it? If 61% of Democrats agree that illegals should be deported, that's a very telling sign. Republicans were also far more likely to agree with the statement asking if illegal immigrants should be arrested and placed in detention camps while they await the deportation. 62% of Republicans said yes, that that was the answer. Arrest them, detain them until, until their deportation could be coordinated. 12% of Democrats believe that. 35% of independents said that. Uh, many of you, I'm going to say that most of our listeners, <laughs> most of my listeners fall into that category of the 60% or more who think that they should be deported. What, what is the solution? How do we do this? Do, do you agree with, with those who say that they should be detained now? That, that when... When law enforcement or social workers come in contact with someone that they know is illegal, should they be detained immediately, held until they can be deported? Your comments are welcome on the text line. Email me, joey at joeyhudson.com. That's it for today's edition of Just the Truth. Thanks for joining me in the Ph.D. Weight Loss and Nutrition Studio to lose weight for the last time visit myphdweightloss.com. If you haven't joined our mailing list yet, visit my website, joeyhudson.com. Just click on the Connect with Joey button so that you can receive our emails and the most up-to-date news. Also, find me on YouTube. Be sure and like, subscribe, uh, follow me on my YouTube channel. Just search for Joey Hudson. Appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with me. Be sure and forward this edition of Just the Truth to some friends. Just click on the Share button. Send it to a few of your contacts because... If we're going to build our community and we're going to win in the June primaries, and if we're going to win in November especially, we got to build an army of conservatives. The way we beat Joe Biden is through educating people and no better way than encouraging them to listen to just the truth. Hey, keep those comments coming via the Furman Ford text line, 864-477-JOEY, 864-477-5639. Your email's always welcome as well. Joey at joeyhudson.com. We're back again tomorrow. Hope you will be too. Remember, God's got this. He's still in control.